Everyone wants to be an influencer. No one wants to be the market expert, but the market experts win. And when you look at like really sexy real estate, I think of like Beverly Hills and a lot of the agents that I coach in the past in Beverly Hills or no, they're encyclopedias of knowledge. Like they are clearly the market experts. They know exactly what's going on, the history of every home, the history of every street, but it's not sexy to talk about the market. Everyone wants to be funny or whatever, right? In our space right now. But competency wins over comedy. All right, you guys, welcome back to another episode of Light It Up Podcast. We are thrilled to have with us today uh, top producing uh, real estate sales coach, David Caldwell. Thank you so much for being here, man. Yeah, man, thanks for having me, I'm excited. We've heard a lot about you. I don't think either Kiro or I have ever actually met you or interacted with you or collaborated with you. But as we were talking about when we were sort of, um, you know, reviewing what we were going to talk about today, we realized we have a lot of mutual connections. So it's it's uh, it's mm -hmm. a pleasure to have you here. We've heard a lot of great things. Yeah. Hey, I've been uh, since you DM me a couple months ago, I've been watching you guys and I'm excited to get to know you guys. And I'm a little surprised that I haven't met you, but I think maybe our uh, we've been in a little bit different worlds and now our worlds are connecting, it seems like. Our worlds are colliding, yeah. as Seinfeld would yeah. say. Right. So for the viewers that don't know who you are, can you briefly introduce yourself? Yeah. So, you know, I've been a real estate agent since 2017. I had my own brokerage for a little while. I have been had a team really for about a decade. We just crossed like the decade mark of having a team and different iterations of the team. A lot of people know me as a real estate coach. I coach a lot of the bigger mega teams with Tom Ferry, but still coach all levels really at Tom Ferry, coach some coaches, coach some solo agents, coach some mega teams. Um, at home, I'm like a dad. I have two little redheaded little girls. I like jujitsu. I work out a lot. Not as jacked as Colton, but trying. <laughs> I love that, man. Yeah, that's huge. You know, every time we have a coach on, I have such a big or a high level of, of respect because when you try to train an agent something and they don't listen, you almost want to kill them. So I can only imagine being in your shoes, training teams, team leaders, mega teams, training individual agents. It might drive you crazy as well. It probably does more than a TL. So yeah, man. Let's jump right into the lightning round. All right, let's hit it. <laughs> so I don't think we've asked anybody this one. What's something you disagree with about the way that you were raised? I had amazing parents, but they didn't put any focus on education. Mm. It was just be a good person and go out in the world and like have friends and be a good person, but no focus on education. I got terrible grades growing up. And as I've gotten older and older, I put so much more value on education. It's a huge part of my life right now as a coach, right? Training and education and constantly learning. That's like one thing that was missing that I wish I had. Mm. But, you know, otherwise I really wouldn't change. I think most people say well, they wouldn't change the way that they were raised. I'm glad that my mom's focus was just go be a good human. And then I picked up, you know, wanting to learn and be a winner later. Nice. So was your traditional behavioral or personality style an amiable and then you've changed from an amiable to like an analytical? You know, it's funny because whenever I disc out, I always disc out like really high as a driver. What I found is being analytical gets me to my goal faster. Mm -hmm. So I've put more emphasis there in learning because I want to go fast and I want to skip steps but I don't want to have to learn them. So I like to go take the research that's out there and be like, well, okay, well, I could just skip to here, right? Like I don't have to go fail over here. The research and the data is over here. I just had to slow myself down to basically take those lessons from the data. Yeah. And then it feels like I can skip steps and go faster. Yeah. That's some, a good answer. Some of the biggest agents or teams like Bernie, he's an expressive driver. Josh uh, Barker, he's a analytical driver. And he, his response is very similar to that. It's like being able to take action quickly, but analyze where you're going and the outcomes as quickly as possible. And you're moving forward twice the speed. So that's pretty awesome. Yeah, if you look at, if you look at most of the big CEOs, like in you know, S&P 500 CEOs, they're driver analyticals. Yeah. They wanna get there fast, but they're making database decisions. Yeah, that's awesome. All right, next question. Who's someone you really admire? 
I mean, this is really cheesy, but because he's such a big part of my life, I really like in this professional setting, I admire Tom yeah. and I don't admire Tom as much for what he's built, but for who he is, you know, as I was getting to know Tom, his family's always there. He's a super family oriented guy. He has tons of empathy. It's amazing what he remembers about certain people. And I feel like he just goes about, you know, building his organization the right way. Mm. So since we're in a professional context, I'll, I'll say Tom. Sweet. Love it. So, David, if you could go back in time, what's one thing you would tell your teenage self? I think I'd just, it'd probably just be to go faster. Mm. I, I think a lot of times in my life, I'm like, oh, whatever, you got a lot of time. And I still feel that way. But probably between 20 and 30, I just acted too slow. I didn't have like really any sense of urgency. And I still struggle with that a little bit today because of that. So, I think if I could go back, I just always tell myself to just go a little bit faster. Yeah. yeah. Bernie Galrani, um, he's very big in the Mike Ferry organization and team runs a team out of Nashville. Yep. In my mind, he always says, no, your biggest, your biggest oh. flaw is that you think you have time. Yeah. Your problem is you think yeah. you have time. Yep. That one is a, a solid one. And a lot of times the, the analysis by paralysis is what stops a lot of people from moving forward. And then having 100%. multitudes of options is what screws everything up. Cool. One of the questions that we wanted to start off the talk with, and it'll segue into really the heart of the conversation is, tell us, how is the market? How's the market? Do you want me to talk national market? Or do you want me to talk Portland or both? Talk as if you were, uh, you know, uh, an agent on your team was to ask you. Yeah. So I think, you know, the, the marketplace that we're serving right now, we have a 30 year low of new listings coming to the market. So it's inventory restricted. Now, people call it crazy, but it's not crazy. We just have a low inventory market and the market's indicative of every low inventory market. But if you're an agent, what's challenging is if we're going to a dinner party, there just aren't enough plates at the table for everybody. So to get a seat at the table, you got to be there early. You got to get there often. You have to be in rapport with people. You know, what hurt the consumer during the Great Recession was home values going down. What hurt the real estate agent was the amount of transactions. And we're dealing with essentially the same number of transactions in 2023 that we saw during the Great Recession. And I'm not sure every real estate professional has picked up on that yet. Hmm. Why is that question so hard to answer as a real estate professional for others? Why is that something that so many people aren't educating themselves about and that, as you see as a coach, is a challenge? As a coach, I've almost tried to create my brand around being the market expert, but it's not sexy. Yeah. You know, everyone wants to be an influencer. No one wants to be the market expert, but the market experts win. And when you look at like really sexy real estate, I think of like Beverly Hills and a lot of the agents that I coach in the past in Beverly Hills or no, they're encyclopedias of knowledge. Like they are clearly the market experts. They know exactly what's going on, the history of every home, the history of every street. But it's not sexy to talk about the market. Everyone wants to be funny or whatever, right, in our space right now. But competency wins over comedy, in my opinion. I love that. Competency over comedy. That's a strong one. The competent side of you is what's going to get you, you know, informed. And once you're informed, you can make good decisions. And then that's what creates the success. But as what David's saying, it's, it's not as much... You know, you're not going to get as many likes when you put that sort of content out there. Yeah. But the one thing that you also said, David, that's interesting. You said there's enough, the amount of same, same amount of transactions now as there was during the Great Recession, right? Mm-hmm. So we know that the Great Recession, how many transactions, David, give or take, do you know that was around that same time? We'll probably be between four and four and a half million this year in the United States. Now, during the Great Recession, I'm aware that the agent count went from like 1.5 or 1.3 down to like 900,000 or maybe even slightly mm-hmm. less from there. So right now we're at like, I think 1.7 million agents in Mm -hmm. the whole thing. And that's probably just agents that are active with NAR, not just licensed agents. Mm -hmm. So that's the level of competition is so much more, but you gave a really good analogy. Like it's like going to a dinner, but there's not enough seats at the dinner table. Mm -hmm. So how does somebody stand out with the market knowledge and being an expert in today's market to gain more market share? Yeah. Well, like I said, you have to be there early and you have to be there often, right? Like a lot of people are transacting based on proximity. So let's say you're an agent who's a marketer. You have to disrupt the proximity by being there early in like the cycle when people start thinking about buying and selling real estate. And frequency is what creates trust. 
Mm. Right. And even if I'm making phone calls, because I think the best businesses are prospecting based marketing enhanced, you know, whether I'm calling or marketing, that frequency is super important. And I have to be there. The average real estate agent just doesn't make phone calls at all. They send bad marketing. They don't do much marketing. Uh, One thing I've been talking a lot with my clients is if your dentist calls you twice a year to get your teeth cleaned, you don't go to a different dentist. Yeah. Right. You know, and this industry, real estate, it's full of people that are like lovely and kind, say it all the time in group calls. But kindness isn't why they hire you if they have multiple options, right? Mm -hmm. So as real estate professionals, our job is just to go be in the flow with people and find the people in all areas of the funnel and make sure they know that we're the best option out of the eight that they know. Yeah. So what are some strategies to get, like, you know, those prospective clients early on? What are some strategies that they can implement to get that? If you look at the statistics, you know, between 50 and 70% of people are just buying based on proximity. Almost every agent, they underappreciate their database. So the simplest strategy you could deploy probably is like a weekly email and a biannual call. Mm. Now, everyone says it should be quarterly calls or it should be a monthly call. That's tough, right? But it's really easy to operationalize a weekly email and a biannual call. And for some people, that's enough. Yeah. Maybe you have some core advocates in there that you need to operationalize some lunches or you need to like love on them a little bit more, but you definitely don't have to like throw a party that's equivalent to a wedding to get referrals. Yeah. You just have to ask. And most agents don't ask, you know, open houses are totally unappreciated. You get to skip to face to face in this marketplace. Open houses are a great place to be because the consumer is out. Like if they're walking through the door you get a skip to face to face. How much time do we spend trying to get face to face instead of just meeting someone there? Exactly. Um, you know, in the past, I would like defer out some sign calls. I have a sign call today after this. You know, I could have given it to one of my agents. It's a high price point. I'm going to go. Yeah. You know, you yeah. said something earlier trust is built over frequency, frequency. over a uh, period of time. But the one thing that's there too is you're trying to nurture this relationship so they can trust you and that you can earn their business. But when to implement or when to start building urgency so they can act is something else too because sometimes someone might do it prematurely and then it'll turn off that client they're like oh he just you know it's it's transactional it's not relational how do you define the difference and when is the right time to implement some urgency everyone gets stuck on scripts and i always like to think of them as offers so at some point like i make someone an are you ready offer like we had a we had a call the other day as an online lead They wanted to know what their home value was. And I'm like, you know, before we talk about home value, let's see where you guys are like in the process. That's what's going through my head. So I started like talking about the market and asking her a series of questions. And for her home, I mean, truly the optimal time to put it on the market would be in the next couple of months. So I basically gave her like an, are you ready question after I talked about the market and if they would consider putting their home on the market in the next 60 days. And it was a hard no. I mean, the, the agent on my team with me was like, what happened, you know? <laughs> yeah. But, but it was fine. I made the offer. She said no. And now I know that we skipped to like a nurturing phase. Mm. But you have to ask these like, are you ready questions at some point? And it might just be something like, hey, Cairo, I, know, I don't know if it's for you, but if you have been thinking about selling your home this year, would you want to sit down and talk about value? And then to say, no, it's not for me. Well, if you know anyone who's been thinking about buying or selling real estate this year, would you mind connecting me with them in a text message? Yeah, sure. Yeah. And, you know, but what's interesting about that, that uh, dialogue is, you know, I think of, you, you probably know the name Steve Powers, right? Steve has coached, uh, he was a Mike, I think so. he's a Mike, he was a Mike yeah. Ferry coach back in the day. He now has his own coaching company. Uh, sure. He's been a huge mentor to me and Kiro. I remember him years ago was like, I think I had a similar sort of scenario where I'm like, Steve, what do I do? All these people say, yeah, tell me what my home is worth. And I'm running comps for all of these people, but they're not actually ready or they're not in the stage as you had had, had referred to them, right? So you find yourself sometimes as a newer agent or an agent who just doesn't know any better, you're running comps for all these people who aren't even in the right stage to make that decision. And they're not, you haven't yet asked them, are you ready? So I guess what I was getting at is what's interesting about that dialogue is you you diverted the conversation to, are you even ready yet to talk about numbers? Because a lot of people, it's, it's human nature for people to be like, yeah, how much? I would love to know what my most yep. valuable asset is worth today. 
Yeah. In, in that situation, it didn't matter what her home was worth. Like we had to switch her focus to buying mm. and get her motivated on where she's going next. Yeah. But the average agent, they're too passive and no one wants to be a salesperson anymore. And we are salespeople. You know, NAR says we're entrepreneurs, which actually I think is why we get upcharged so many things. If we were just like 5% of agents are entrepreneurs and 95% are salespeople and you wouldn't act like a salesperson, you know, we wouldn't have a 90% failure rate because people would actually go make sales. Yeah. But if you're a salesperson, you have to make offers and you have to ask direct questions, even if they're somewhat passive. Yeah. No, that's that's solid. The, the, the one thing I've been realizing more or less now, because there's so many agents in the marketplace right now and there's so little transactions to be had, there's never been more people calling the same lists of leads and stuff like that. So it's like the same people are calling the same leads, yeah. more or less, right? Yeah. But it's the ones that stand out more and can dig in a little deeper, right? So like for Justice is Just Sold scripts, people will be robotic with it. Like, when do you plan on moving? Never. Okay, next. But then when you're like sharing like a just listed comp or a just sold comp, and you can like elaborate a little bit more, which is non-traditional. Like, so tell me a little bit more. What's your thoughts about that list price? Or what's your thoughts about that sale price? And you can have them just open up the floodgates and you can see where they're at in that process. You know when to encourage and just try to be a little bit more urgency building versus maybe let's take a step back and build more relationship so that we can nurture it further on from there. 100%. Yeah. So in, in, right now, as you're coaching these teams, what are some of the common struggles that you're seeing teams face right now in this marketplace? Well, I think a lot of people got used to being pandemic superstars <laughs> and everyone was so highly motivated that everyone thought they were incredible. Yeah. Right. And now people actually have to go to work and you're seeing who's willing to work and who isn't. So for team leaders, it's realizing that a percentage of my team probably has to go because they don't have the work ethic to succeed in this marketplace or they're going to go because it's not as easy and they think the grass is greener somewhere else. For the average salesperson, they weren't having to have a lot of conversations to reach their goal. And we have to have more today because, you know, on our team, we talk about if we find two people that are in interest and say they want to do something, only one of them is really going to act. Yeah. Right. Like the pipeline fallout is huge right now. And you're seeing that on teams. But, you know, most teams are comprised of the average agent with on average opportunities and they haven't had to learn that lesson yet. Yeah. Right. They haven't. A lot of them haven't been in the business long enough. So that's another one. Um, the big thing that I see with big teams is that they have been buying productivity over the last couple of years instead of creating it. Mm. So you, you got to go teach them to create it, you yeah. know, instead of just running their credit card and hoping to get it. Yeah. It's not a great way to profitability in a marketplace like we're in today. Yeah. I was just going to say to elaborate on that for, for the people who, you know, don't understand what, what exactly he's saying here is this, you know, for the last couple of years, my interpretation is that we've been buying Zillow leads and we've been buying this and sure. And yeah. we didn't need to have the skills to convert those leads because a lot of those people didn't care who let them in the house. It was just, can you get me there at three o'clock today? Yep. And I think one of the analogies that, that, that I've mentioned, I think Robbie T. Tykes hoop. Yeah. He's like, we've all been playing basketball on a little tykes hoop for the last two, mm -hmm. three years. And just slamming, you know, slam dunks left and right. And now all of a sudden the hoop has been raised to the, you know, the mm -hmm. professional height. And now we're all pissed off because none of us are making baskets. Yeah. Yep. And uh, it's just interesting. One of the biggest reflections I've had recently, and it dawns on me so much that, you know, they say the activities of yesterday won't get you what you want to do today. But it's not really just about the activities. It's the idea and the mentality you had when it was a different marketplace. Like I have recordings from Matthew Ferry that were over Baruch music of scripts, right? I had like so many different things where you fell in love with certain parts of the process and you were obsessed with the process, not the outcomes that it produced. So like during COVID, the outcomes were overwhelming, right? And you could buy the outcomes. But now that you can't yeah. buy the outcomes, you're no longer attached or committed or obsessed with the process. So now you're just looking back and your emotional mood is essentially based off of the outcomes not off of yeah. you being obsessed with the process of you being able to say, okay, great, this isn't, didn't work. Like you kind of went on earlier, like moving fast, right? Knowing what doesn't work, knowing what works and moving quickly in that direction and constantly making minor improvements to go there, right? Why do you think that people haven't realized that element of, uh, of the love of the process again? Well, I think when people are on this, like I call it like a novice to mastery journey, they get to where they're pretty good and then they go get a new thing to get good at. Mm-hmm instead of just getting to mastery. 
I think very few entrepreneurs actually get to mastery in what they're doing before they go add another lead pillar or go trail off and go try to do something different. And I mean, I'm guilty of that for sure. You know, my team was doing 170 to 200 deals a year for a couple of years and I got stuck and I'm like, well, I'll go be a coach. And, you know, we're still we're still stuck because now I've divided my attention. So I think that's really common in this industry. You know, you have big competitive personalities that are used to winning. Something becomes a little bit easier instead of really scaling it. We go switch off. And I had a whole bunch of clients go to an event last week. And before they went, I called them and I said, don't go down there and get blinded by opportunity. Like there's stuff we're doing really good. I just want you to come back with one or two ideas to help us get better at those things. That's good advice. That is. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. That hit like a, like a truck right there. That's so true because every time in this business, the mundane and the boring gets so boring that you're like, I don't want to keep doing this repetitious boredom thing. Oh, this seems shiny. Mm -hmm. but, you, but you don't realize that that's what actually got you where you were. Yeah. Or, or sometimes you take it for granted. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. if you look at people like Tom, Mike, all these the presentations they give on stage is relatively the same since the beginning of their careers, but it's just consistent repetition of the same things over and over and over again, right? Leads to mastery and they can be able to excel and get better and better and better the same way like comedians yeah. have the same pitch over and over again. I guess that's the evil of our industry in the same way that there's so many options to make money, but deciding to say yes to something, you also say no to another thing. And that no yeah. thing you think you have full control of, but you're not mastering it fully yet there. What other challenges are you seeing teams or individual agents feel, uh, facing as well now too? Well, if we go back to like that, how's the market question? Yeah. In a lot of marketplaces right now, if you're flat, you're beating the market by 30%. And because there isn't an awareness of what's actually happening in the market, there's just a gut feeling about what's happening. People don't recognize they're winning when they are. Elaborate on Does that. Does that make sense? A so are like, you saying agents? Uh, it, Agents, yeah. yeah, or agents or teams. You did 100 deals last year. You do 100 deals this year in a marketplace that has 30% less transactions. You beat the market. It's winning. Mm -hmm. But a lot of these teams aren't recognizing that as a win because they feel like they're staying flat. Well, the marketplace is declining. There's declining opportunities. In a growth year, they'd be growing their business. Mm. So that's been a challenge. Like One of the things I've had a lot of my larger teams start reporting to me is similar to a publicly traded uh, company, the CEO, once a quarter, they come on a call, they tell you how they grew, and they give you an outlook. Hey, this is what happened in the market. This is what we think what's going to happen next quarter. Here's what's happened with our business. Here's changes, if any, we're going to make, or here's where we think opportunities are. Mm -hmm. It takes the gut feeling out of what's happening in the market, and it lets them know like what's really working and what isn't. And sometimes setting up those calls is hard because like, what the fuck are we doing? Sorry if I'm not supposed to swear <laughs> on here. Thing. And I'm like, I'm like, we'll just, we'll just set it up, right? And some people, when they get off those calls, they feel like they're really winning. Some feel like, you know, they're they're not winning as much as they were, but they know where they're at. And I just yeah. think that most people in this business right now, they don't know where they're at or where the market's at. If if we're lucky, they're coming in and following a daily, weekly, monthly checklist. But most of us don't do that. You know, most real estate professionals and salespeople aren't the most disciplined people if we think of the average. So the, the a huge problem is not knowing where you're at. If you have a map and you're trying to go from here to here, we all fuck it up along the way. Mm -hmm. But some of us mess it up even more. Right. And if you don't know what's going on in the marketplace, it's really hard to hit your destination. Yeah. So the biggest problem with today's like uh, world, it's where do you get the reliable information from? Because like if you were to Google certain stats about the marketplace, every single resource has a different number, different opinion. And uh, it just you never get a clear picture of what's going on. So how do you assess a true sense of what's really well, going on? It also depends what what part of the market you're looking at. Are you looking at it from a buyer's perspective, yeah. a seller's perspective? Well, if you're looking investor's at investor's perspective. Well, transaction. The cool count. thing for us, yeah, the cool thing for us is it's all in our MLS. Like every MLS I've ever looked at with clients for five years has a market stats or trends button that's dusty and nobody looks at. And all you have to do is go in and and yeah. look at the data and try to identify some trends. I mean, my MLS is like 
it's like playing Oregon Trail in elementary school. The technology is terrible. Yeah. But I can go in and find the data that I need. And, you know, we tell all these stories all the time about how in Portland in the last 26 of 30 years, we've seen appreciation. Hmm. And if you go on my Instagram page, we have a, a little card that shows what's happened in the marketplace, which has become a powerful tool when people are talking about the market declining. Well, our market hasn't declined in value and history would tell us it's actually not going to. Yeah. And then we could you know, go to this data, which is all data we pulled out of the MLS. It was actually data they had available to us. They just don't tell the story that way. We just took the numbers, put it you know, in a nice little picture with our VA, yeah. and now it's a tool. I yeah. love it. So the, the data is right in front of us. We just don't go look at we just don't go look for it. And what's an opportunity for team leaders and salespeople is you go find the data, you can go find a way to tell the story. Yeah. And then you're the storyteller because your MLS isn't going to, and ninety-nine percent of the agents in your market aren't going to either. Yeah, that's a great point. So for team leaders, that's a strategy that they can use knowing the numbers. Now for an in individual agent, let's say they're circle prospecting around a listing. What data points, what market stats should they know to educate the consumer who's fearful and doubting the market? Well, my favorite like circle dial call right now would be like, you know, hey, John, it's David Caldwell with Hillshire Realty Group. We just sold 123 Main Street for a million bucks. Mm -hmm. Hey, would you want to sit down for 10 minutes and talk about how the sale of that home impacts the value of yours? Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's say they're like, oh, well, we don't know if the market's there yet. We'll, we want to wait because we hear all the gloom and doom going on. Yeah, in the last 26 or 30 years in the Portland housing market, we've actually seen housing appreciation. And over the last 12 months, the real estate market is actually still up 3%. And if we think about all the all the horrible things that have happened over the last 30 years and the last year, you know, you'd think values would decline, but history would tell us that they actually don't because we have an undersupply of homes in Portland. Okay, so just overall growth rate within the last 12 years and if you're looking at the historical rate knowing year over year growth. That's like some of the things that you'd want to know when you're doing, especially circle prospecting, cold calling. Yeah. Like, like the objection that you just gave me was someone doubting what happened in the marketplace. Yep. You're probably not going to object to that after that stat I just gave you. And Correct. I can say, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm happy to send this over to you. So I'm just looking for like little numbers and stories that I can tell and that I can train the agents on my team or the teams I coach, you know, like what are the stories that you can tell that just totally overcome that objection or what's the, you get someone on the phone, what's the script that you could say where maybe you start out with one of those facts yeah. and now you remove that objection. Hey, Zillow connected us 12 months ago and I'm not sure if you knew this, but the average sales price in Portland has grown 3% over the last 12 months. And if you're still in the market for a new home, I just want to check in and see where you're at. Yeah. Well, now you're, you're not going to tell me you're waiting for, or that values have declined. That's why you're waiting. Yeah. Now you might say I'm waiting for values to decline, but you're not going to say, well, values have been going down. That's why I haven't bought. Mm -hmm. Right. No, that's solid. I love that. The 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 one thing um, I'm curious to know. So right now, as you're you're coaching these teams, are you of the mindset of skill development per agent productivity, or would you say that it makes more sense to recruit more bodies to develop? Because certain coaches will say, you know, develop the skills within each person, and others people will say, bring more people in, and then you can develop everybody at the same time and see who succeeds and who doesn't. Yeah, I mean, it's it's both. The, the reality is agent count is what wins. I mean, go through the Real Trends 500 teams, uh, go through the Real Trends 500 um, boutique, like independent brokerages, per agent productivity in like the nation across the board is like 10, yeah. right? Like if you remove people's admin staff out, a lot of times people are producing at that level. I think the statistic is if you do 25 transactions, that you're in the top 3% of agents in the country. What are the odds that you have a team comprised of the top 3% agents in the country? I mean, it's, it's certainly probable if you have a smaller team, but a lot of these larger teams that I'm coaching, yeah. it's definitely agent count. And there's a lot of teams I'm working with right now that are trying to get to you know a thousand listings a year. How do we operationalize that? Okay. And as a coach, I'm convinced that the answer is agent count and skill development. So to make sure both like it's not PPC leads, count. it's not, it's not an offer, you know, it's, it's agent count, bring more people in, bring more people and, in and develop them and develop them. Yeah. And odds are, I don't know what the percentage is, but only a percentage of them are going to be, you know, in that 25 deal a year level. Right. I mean, it's a numbers yeah, game, I mean, it's no matter what. 
and this is, you know, and, and not poo-pooing on anyone that uh, has great people on their team, but I do believe that the average team member in the country is just the average agent in the marketplace with unaveraged opportunities. Unaveraged opportunities is leadership. Unaveraged opportunity is systems and structure. It's training. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily leads. Yeah. It's proximity. It's coaching. It's training environment. Well, yeah, but one thing that you said there that's actually pretty good to go into too is we're talking about the change in the marketplace and what you'd have to do as a, a group, like a team, what you'd have to do as an individual agent, certain things that you'd have to know and adapt. But as a leader, what certain skills do you now need to develop? Because the, you know, going from a salesperson to a team leader is one transition in itself and it's a painful, painful one, right, to learn. Uh, but what does a leader need to know now to lead people in a changing market like this? I'd say how to be a leader. There's this Simon Sinek story where he talks about how people send their executives to like an offsite for a leadership yeah. conference. And they're like, oh, here, here you are. You're a leader. What I found is that most people in you know, our seats, I know you guys are team leaders too. They're not actively working on developing their leadership skills. They're not going to leadership conferences. They're not reading leadership books. You ask them to define leadership or leadership traits. And a lot of times they can't do that. You know, leading people is different than selling people. You always hear, you know, leadership is influence and it is. But, you know, I think a trait of good leaders is actually caring about your people's ability to achieve their goals, not your own. Yeah. You know, I think the best leaders, you know, if you're trying to sell 500 homes a year, 300 homes a year, you're just piecing that transaction volume together based on people's goals. Mm. And sometimes... People's numbers are too big and sometimes they're too small. And leaders should be coaching people to their best no matter what. But if I have someone on my team who's great and their goal is 12 transactions and they're capable of 25, I'm going to lose if I just try to drive them to 25 instead of like get them to 12 and encourage them to try to get to 15 because they're better than that. Yeah. But I think a lot of people in our space you know, they're not leaders. There are plenty of teams where all they're giving people is a card with a logo. They're giving them an endorsement. Those, those people on those teams, they're not being led. And then there are true leaders in the industry. Um, I coach Kevin Sturdivant. He is an industry leader. Mm. He is a great leader in his marketplace. Um, it's like, it's almost like he's creating a movement, right? But people want to be around him because he's just so good at building people up and making them better, yeah. but he does it very unselfishly and it's never about him. Yeah. No, that's, that's, uh, Kevin's a good example of it because he's very selfless. I think of Colton too. When I think of that too, he's mm -hmm. just very vulnerable and shares his story and shares like why, yeah. why his mission, his plan is and his vision. And he carries good integrity with his actions that yeah. align with that vision as well. What are other characteristics of, like world-class leaders that you see that would need to be there for someone to actually be able to grow and build? Leaders are market experts. If we want to like take it back to one of the first questions on like, how do you lead the market? You have to know what's going on. Yeah. If you look at like any first-class executive, they really understand their industry. They understand the competition. They understand different models. They understand there's different paths to hit their goal. So they have an ability to pivot. Yeah. They know how to develop people, or if they don't know how to develop people, they know how to hire people to develop their people. You have to know how to delegate if you're going to be a strong leader and understand your strengths and weaknesses. With the biggest team leaders that I coach, they all have one trait in common is a huge desire to win. Mm. I mean, they are um, sometimes it's difficult because they want to go to the next level and they might not even be able to give you the answer on what the, the next level is. Yeah. But their desire to win is so strong that they're able to just drive initiatives and pivot and understand what they're doing right and understanding what they're doing wrong. Yeah. I think that in itself, when, you, when you're preaching a vision and you have so much conviction that you're determined to get to those goals, it's not about the person believing in your vision. It's if they see you believe in it so much that you're like believing your vision so much, now they believe in you because you believe it. So that's yeah. another way that you can buy people into that vision too is by having that kind of For sure. winning mindset. What are some resources, tools to go towards to develop those kind of leadership skills? Because it's, you get so, you spend so many years developing sales skills and then you try to implement those sales skills like you said earlier, and now you're trying to sell people to motivate them to move forward. And then you realize how that blows back in your face, like really bad. Or you're just, 
you're just thinking that people are going to be the handle, same person, be the same as you. Yeah. They're going to handle situations yeah. the same. And you get frustrated because you say like, yeah, you start having that men that mentality of like, well, I could, I could have closed that transaction. You only wanted to make a hundred. What's wrong with you? Like, yeah. don't you want a better yeah. life? And then they're like, okay, then maybe this person doesn't like want what's it's for selfish reasons. So what are some good ways to develop that? So like, let's say someone's there, they're producing a good amount as an independent agent. Now they want to build a team. So now they're ripping at the seams. They need to hire a buyer's agent to take over the flow, the overflow. What are some of the things, the tools that they should reference to so that way they can develop those skills? Well, I think you have to decide what your leadership style is going to be. Like, I really like servant leadership. And I mean, there's just tons and tons and tons of books on it. I mean, John Maxwell, Simon Sinek books, et cetera. There's no lack of resources. There is lack of resourcefulness, right? People just don't go look for the answers and then they just fail and fail and fail. I always think about, um, do you guys ever seen that movie, Good Will Hunting? Yeah. They're in the bar and then they're talking shit to each other. And he's like, oh, you're going to serve me fries. And he's like, you're going to spend you know, this much money on an education that you could have gotten from the public library. Mm. I mean, that's just, that's being resourceful, right? Yeah. Look, I mean, I can't tell you how much I've learned from just watching Simon Sinek videos yeah. on YouTube. Like I've learned a lot about leadership from reading his books and watching him on YouTube. When it comes to hiring a buyer's agent, it's just delegation, right? We don't have to just look to the real estate industry for the answers across all industries. People are delegating, yeah. right? Across all industries, uh, people have administrative assistants across all industries. You know, people have ISA staffs or, you know, call centers, right? Outbound salespeople. So there's tons of lessons that we could learn from other industries, but let's be honest, they probably do it better than us. Yeah. So often as an industry, we're only looking at what we're doing. Uh, for most of my career, I've tried to ignore the real estate industry and try to look outside. Like we're with the same company, which is a virtual company, but I believe productivity lives in an office. And if you people want to argue that, just go look at every Fortune 500 company in America. They're making people go back into an office because productivity lives in an office. It only doesn't live in an office when they're trying to cut costs. Yeah. But when they're trying to maintain profitability, people are in the office. Yeah. The most productive people in this industry, they are in an office in the morning, creating opportunity, and in the afternoon, they're servicing it. Yeah. And that comes with culture, too, within the environment they're in. I forgot what... Uh, uh, study or test they did I, it was definitely in europe somewhere i want to say like sweden or something like that where they had like several students learning something like a new topic or a subject and they made one seem like it was really fun everything else was like mundane and the group that it was associated with fun excelled like tenfold in comparison uh -huh. so it's like culture productivity all within that you can't create a virtual culture yeah totally and so. i think some people need to realize like they just don't have what it takes to be a leader right like you can go online 100%. and watch videos you can, you know, you can read all the books in the world. You can go to events and try to become a better leader. But some people just don't have it in them. And and then, but that doesn't mean you can't grow a team. You can grow a team. Just you just have to make hire that leadership, hire that sales manager. 100%. Um, you know, like I think of like Tina Call, right? She she's told us she's like, I don't, I don't want to be, be a sales coach. Yeah, I don't want to be the sales coach, right? I'm going to bring somebody in mm -hmm. who can do that. And a lot of times, you know, if you have the budget or if you work your way up. To, to generate that team, I guess maybe you have to be in that role for a bit, but work your way up to remove yourself and hire somebody. You can oftentimes hire somebody who's better at it than you anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like you said it earlier, David, right? It's like being able to assess the reality of what's going on around you. So it's like macro and micro within the organism of the team, in the marketplace, within the economy, and being able to establish what steps you need to make to move forward quickly, right? Yeah. No, that's a lot of value there. I guess one thing that we can conclude everything with is the virtues of leadership and what you've seen so far. What are some of the pitfalls that someone should avoid? So here's like common pitfalls. A lot of times, you know, a driver will go, oh, I can't communicate to this person because they're ex, right? Or I can't keep an assistant. It's like, no, you're just being a dick. You're not treating people the way that they deserve to be treated, mm -hmm. right? Uh, drivers actually, when you research personality types, which is what most team leaders are, they actually have the easiest job of changing their personality style. Like they have the easy style of blending in and acting like someone else and like mirror and matching. Mm. So many team leaders, like a big pitfall, like of leaders on team leaders or team leaders is they underpay for a position, right? They hire an administrative assistant at $36,000 a year and they expect $80,000 a year work ethic, right? You just can't get that. You get what you pay for. 
right? Like so many ISAs fail because we get them overseas or we pay them nothing. That is a skilled labor position. Yeah. Right. Not being able to see that, uh, that's a huge pitfall of leadership. But I think that that's just the biggest thing I see is a lack of awareness of what's going on in the business and what it takes to get from here to there. It's like, hey, I wrote a business plan. I just never looked at it again. I wrote a business plan. I just never assessed what it would take to get there. I wanted to hire people. I just didn't care if they were good or not. I didn't interview them. I just hired people because they showed up. Everything you're hitting is so accurate. We had 16 uh, uh, outbound callers like ISAs at one point. Our expectation was for them to call for eight virtual, hours a day. Virtual, so yeah, virtual. They were in the Philippines. Yeah, so they would. Our expectation was for them to call for eight hours a day straight. And when we were venting to one of our mentors, we were like, "Man, it's just like they're calling for eight hours a day. This is their production." He was like, "When's the last time you called for eight hours a day?" I was yeah. like, "No, I wouldn't. That's crazy. I wouldn't do that." He's like, "I'd never do yeah. it." Yeah. Like, do you think you would burn out real quick? I'm like, "You and I have done it, but we haven't done it five days in yeah, a row." Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, not on a daily basis, every single day. But then he was just like, "Wouldn't you burn out?" as well right like it, it should be the incentive should be based off of like the objectives that they're accomplishing not based off of like the length of time that they're just on there just mundanely calling and ringing yeah. and ringing if we go to outside industries right an outside salesperson someone who's making outbound calls at intel nike you know a good company they're making like 150 yeah. they're making like 200 with incentives right just the person setting appointments right even someone, it, go look at the car industry, right? Even those guys are getting paid more than we're paying people in real estate. Yeah. So I think it's, yeah, that, that awareness factor, that's just, it's an easy thing to point out to people. And when they start living in that, you start seeing change in an organization always for the better. Yeah. Now, if you don't want to pay for it as a team leader, which a lot of people don't, then don't. Maybe you're just not ready for that role and you need to go drive revenue in other places. But that those are common mistakes that I've seen. Yeah. It's, uh, uh, I'll, I'll say this, and the I was shadowing Bernie Gellerani's team about a month and a half ago in Nashville, and uh, he has this like massive office space, and it used to be a call collection center where they had 500 outbound callers or just ISAs or individuals making calls nonstop. There was three pits in that building, right? You had the entrance pit, you needed a clearance card to get the next room, which was an interview room, and you needed another clearance to get into the call center room. And the way that it was designed and the reason it was like that is that they were interviewing bulk, a number of people, maybe 10, 15 people every single day. And they were firing five or six people every single day and constantly turning over that whole pond. Yeah. And it was like, it was just madness, right? Where people were just constantly in and out, in and out. And you had to, if they would reject your clearance card, now you couldn't come back in the building. So they made it that way. It was a turn and burn, right? But then yeah. that's why like no one ever wanted to stay there for a long period of time. So upper management was being destroyed, but that's not a business, right? Yeah. Essentially, if the model is to just constantly recruit and turn and burn, you're going to essentially saturate it and then end up yeah. like burning everybody in that <laughs> that field yeah. eventually. Um, so something that can live and something that can be a brand that's actually people want to be a part of yeah. is something that has those yeah. features. One of the ways I've coached people for a long time is what's the fastest, easiest way for them to achieve their goal where they're happy to go to work every day? Create an environment where you enjoy being in. Yeah, but sometimes you can just ask them that. Like, hey, what's the fastest, easiest way for you to achieve your goal where you'd be happy going to work every day? And they'll tell you, right? And if they don't know, you could coach them to it. Mm. But as a coach, that's like a framework that like lives in my head. Because if I can get someone to go to work every day where they're happy and do something consistently, they're going to win. Yeah. Right? And then sometimes I can add in those things they don't like. Like I had this gal that I coach who's really into video and all she wanted to do was video. And if you actually looked at where her business came from, I don't think she would have to do another video ever again to be successful. Yeah. But I'm like, hey, for every two hours of video creation you do, you owe me an hour of calling. Mm. What do you guys think happened in the next six months in her business? It blew up. It blew up, right? Because the, the outbound, you know, it, it went from a cold call to a warm call because of the marketing she was doing. Mm. But waiting for it to come inbound, a lot of those inbound, inbound calls never came. Yeah. yeah. Right. She's happy going to work making videos. Well, I can add an hour that's maybe a little bit uncomfortable. And guess what? She's money motivated. As soon as the money came, she loved that task. Yeah. yeah. Now she probably converted into prospecting focused, marketing based instead of marketing focused and no prospecting any at all. Yeah. That's awesome. Cool, man. Great. This has been awesome, David. Anything else that you want to share in closing? 
Just you know, you told me earlier that it was a dull day. I'm, I bet no, I made no, a duller. No, so I man. apologize for that. You made numbers sexy. We were both analytical, and uh, we mm-hmm. we were driving with what you were saying. And when while we were doing some research on on you and and your business, and uh, you know uh, where you came from, um, it was a lot of uh, a lot of numbers based. Uh, whether we were looking at old podcasts or YouTube videos, so you know we were ready for it and and. But that's what we both get excited about too. Yeah. You, if you if you can't track it, whether it's the market or your own team's numbers, then you can't prove it. So. Yeah. Um, Just in reflection, one of the biggest things that you said that I don't know if many people would actually like, unless they, you know, meditate or just think about it a little bit more, not having a clear sense of where the market is and the activities that they're doing, whether it's a win or a fail, their vision gets blurred, and if their vision gets blurred, their activities get dictated and they get affected by that. So. Having a clear yeah. sense of where you're at and knowing those numbers gives you a clearer direction of where to go. Because if I was traveling to the beach and I my navigation was not working, right? I would be like, shit, I'm out of luck, but I'm on the right way, right? But I'm like, damn, because I don't have a navi in front of me, I'm freaking out. So your vision gets clogged. Now you're most likely going to get in an accident because you're freaking out about that whole thing. But knowing yeah. where you're going is so important and knowing the status of what's happening around you is a crucial part that's being overlooked right now. Yeah, well, let me add something to that because I want to add this in earlier. People romanticize their results, right? And that's what you're talking about. People get like their focus gets blurred, but people romanticize their results. And I don't want to make this like a shitting on video conversation, but so many people think they're killing it on Instagram. They're just doing sphere deals and the preferred method of communication is Instagram. Mm -hmm. But Was it really an Instagram deal or was it a sphere deal, right? You just DM people and it was a sphere deal, right? Like everyone's on Instagram or TikTok every day, you know, I look at like an Instagram deal as I had no personal connection to that person and then they came in. Otherwise, came nowhere. Instagram, I just I just nurtured them. But people are like, oh, Instagram's all my business. I'm like, no, all your business is sphere. You're yeah. just romanticizing this thing that you really like, which is cool. But like if there's something we like doing, again, what can I add to it where I could actually go get a better result instead of just romanticizing or having these blurred realities of what my business looks like? Because it's hard to scale if you don't really know what's going on. Yeah. Just to, to add on to that, it's that's exactly a great example as an agent who is just committed to calling expireds, committed to calling expireds. All the expireds wash up and they're like, I'm still calling expireds, but there's none to be called. Yeah. yeah. Right. It's a lead source. It's a pillar. Yeah. I was always told you have to have what four lead sources like a table like the legs of a table if you're heavy expires and the market changes then you're fucked you're screwed yeah if uh you're heavy fizzbos then and the market changes then you know you're screwed there so if a portion of your database refi or just bought a house and the rate is two or three percent no matter how many videos you post there ain't gonna change to a six or seven percent rate no matter how great (laughs) you look in the videos but you constantly need to adapt and grow those pillars uh david you're honestly a wealth of knowledge man this has been awesome Looking forward to keeping this, uh, you know, collaboration relationship with you, man. It's been great. How does someone get in touch with you if they want to connect, uh, collaborate, have a conversation? Yeah, e- email me at david at hillshirerealtorgroup dot com, or you can find me on those platforms we were making fun of, which is just uh, David C Caldwell on there. And yeah, hopefully I'll see you guys at like a conference coming up. I'm sure I will. Yeah, so definitely awesome. will. Thank you again. We appreciate you, brother. Cool guys.